Welcome everyone to this broadcast of Ascend TV Live on the Autism Spectrum. Uh, today our guest is behaviorist Michelle Hecht. I'm Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burning. Mm -hmm. And before we begin with our guest, Will, what's with your shirt? Glad you asked. My my first shirt of the um, my first shirt of the year is my Presidio Von, Von my Presidio Stewart shirt. See, I, I volunteer with Presidio Stewarts every every other Saturday in 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 the in in the Presidio and different areas, including Dragonfly Creek and Upper Lobos and Mountain Lake Park. They've they've re they've re they've restarted their program during last year after after getting through COVID and. and 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 now they're back to being being out being in person again. Excellent. Well, thank you. Uh, you're doing some very good work there. Good. Would you like to now uh, begin with our guest, Michelle Hecht? Gladly, Michelle. Can you tell us about your background and how you became a behavioral therapist? Yeah. Thanks for the question, Will, and for having me here on the show at Ascend TV. So my background probably started when I was a teenager working in summer camp. Um, I worked many years in summer camps and I found myself really drawn to the kids at the camp who were sort of on the fringe, who weren't included, maybe they were deliberately excluded, just because they were a little different. Um, they were a little different from everyone else and I, it really brought out my sense of social justice and compassion seeing those kids and I really enjoyed them. I found this community really interesting. Um, they were creative, they were cool. and for reasons I couldn't understand, they were not being included. So I think that was uh, where I, I, my interest in the community really originated. The director of the camp suggested I go into education someday, and I, I took that to heart, and I went on to study psychology and educational psychology and special ed and behavior analysis, and I worked for many years uh, with babies and children in public schools um, and also at um, the Autism Center of Northern California with infants who are just diagnosed with autism, working with their families. And um, maybe about 12 years ago, I started working with adults at the Arc of San Francisco and with other agencies in the Bay Area that work with adults. And as my own kids aged, I seemed to progress my professional life to working with people who were the same age as my own kids. So I, I have kids who are now in their 20s, and much of my work focuses on people in their 20s or older. I don't work with children anymore. And I love working with this community. I feel like this is where I'll be for the rest of my career. And um, I think one of the reasons I like this work so much is the original reason that I liked working with those communities when I was a teenager is it's a really interesting community. It's a fun community. I really enjoyed it. It's a very inclusive community. And it's also a community that is um, not getting the resources they deserve and they need. It's an underserved community. There's, a, there's an increasing number of behavior analysts and people in special education, and most of them work with children and there's just fewer uh, professionals working um, with people with autism as adults. And so I feel like this is the, my home for the rest of my career. Can you tell us about the relation of behavioral therapy to, to, other, therapy, to other therapists? Mm -hmm. Other types of therapy, yeah. So behavior analysis is, is behaviorism is where, you know, behaviorists are anchored in the science of human behavior or behaviorism, behavior analysis. And that's really understanding how the environment impacts behavior. And we use some tools that can be really unique to our practice, they're essential to our practice. So we use very clear definitions of what we're talking about. So someone might come to me and say, I want to be a better boyfriend. Um, and that's a really lovely um, desire. It's not very specific. There's many, many ways to be a better boyfriend, and part of it depends what you're doing right now as a boyfriend. Part of it depends the kind of person you are, the kind of uh, partner you have, what your partner wants. And um, so uh, one of the tools we use is using clear behavioral definitions. So I might work with that person to clarify what do they mean by that? Does that mean um, asking your partner questions about themselves and listening to them when they answer you? Does it mean asking your partner what they would like to do on a date instead of doing what you would like to do? Um, there's many ways to be a better boyfriend, and a behaviorist would help you clarify and give a really clear objective goal. 
right? And the nice thing about that clear objective goal is we can see when it's happening and when it's not, and we can even measure it. And behavior analysts use data a lot. We measure, we ask people to take a baseline. How's it going right now? You know, well, what kind of a boyfriend are you right now? Do you ever let your partner decide what, the, what you guys do on a date or do you always decide? So we get a baseline measurement and then we might um, take data on change, right? What happened last week? Did it get better? Did you ask twi allow your partner twice to decide the activity on the date? Um, so, and we also, um, very importantly, we use evidence-based interventions. So there's a lot of research on different types of interventions, some of which are more effective than others. And as a behaviorist, I would, um, I would draw from that evidence base to select interventions that suit the situation, suit the individual, and also have data to support their use. Can you tell us about how you work with our autism community? Cut. What? The timing, the timing was off. All right. <coughs> Again. Go. Can you tell us about your, can you tell us about how you work with our autism community? Yeah, that's a big question. I have a lot, I play a lot of different roles in, in this community. So I work as a consultant for a different um, Bay Area agencies that provide services uh, for adults on the spectrum and people with in intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, as a behavior <laughs> consultant, I might do staff training to support staff so that they're better able to work with people on the spectrum or with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, I also work directly with clients. Some people um, might reach out to me and I work privately where we would, they would identify things that are um, important to them that they want to make change in their lives, right? They might find areas that they're having some struggles with and they want to create some meaningful change and change is really difficult. And um, so we might work together. Uh, one important role that I play um, and activity that I do with my clients, maybe one of the first things we do, is we have to find a source of motivation, right? When people are trying to change their behavior, that's really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we're making changes that are really important to us, but maybe we're changing something that we've done for our whole lives and we're trying to do something new. And that's very, very hard and can be hard to motivate. And there's all sorts of other forces out there at play, right? Like, so lots of people are um, very drawn by their cell phones and all the social media and other, um, other things pulling at us, right? There's a lot of things pulling at us and sometimes we want to create change and these other forces, maybe a friend is calling and they're distracting us from our goal. So there's a lot of things to manage. So the first thing we do is we work on somebody's motivation. And the way to get motivated is to understand why is this behavior change important to me in the first place, right? And the way we understand that is usually the way I understand it is by applying one aspect of acceptance and commitment therapy, which is called values. We do values identification, right? And we help understand what's important to you. So I'm going to mm -hmm. give you an example. Say somebody comes to me and they say, I want to show up, I want to improve my timeliness. I want to arrive on time better. Because running late, it's a problem a lot of people struggle with. It's not the end of the world, and in some communities it's okay to be late. Um, but in our world here in the United States, there's a lot of circumstances where we're expected to show up on time. Friends expect us to show up on time when we're meeting them socially. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they feel like we don't care about them, right? It might, it might send a message if we're not on time. Um, our employers expect us to show up on time. Our teachers expect us to show up at class on time. So say somebody says, I want to improve my timeliness and I want to show up to work on time. Um, we step back and we think, well, why would you want to do that? Why is that important to you? And somebody might say, um, well, I might get fired if I don't show up on time. And frankly, that could be a really good motivator, right? Not wanting to get fired, right? Jobs are important. If you have a job you like, you don't want to get fired. And so maybe showing up on time is a really important um, skill to have. Um, somebody else might say that I, um, I, I, a community is important to me and being included is important and being a team player is important and, and so showing up on time is part of that, right? So we tap into that motivation because that's going to help you 
when you have to do something difficult, like maybe getting up a few minutes early, or maybe um, picking your clothes the night before, or skipping the donut um, mm. shop on the way to work. All right, maybe not the donut shop. <laughs> <laughs> so in any case, we might start there, right there with motivation. And, um, and that's, that's uh, one way that I work uh, with individual clients in helping to um, identify their, um, and meet their goals. Thank you very much, Michelle, and Will, too. Uh, our culture correspondent, uh, Stacey Kennedy, has a couple of questions for our guest. Yeah, so um, do you think change is possible? Oh, that's a great question, Stacey. Um, change is definitely possible. Change is also really hard, and it can depend on what, what behavior you're trying to change, right? Right. Um, I also, um, so, so if you've had a, a behavior you've been using your whole life, it's going to be tricky to change. Yes. Yeah. And so it's going to take time. I also understand that um, people's neurology is going to affect how the change happens, the pace at which the change happens, yeah. Yeah. the difficulty of the change, right? So folks um, who are neurodivergent are going to arrive at that change, at that decision to make a change in their own unique way, and they're going to navigate that uniquely. But change is absolutely possible. I wouldn't be doing what I do if I didn't think that. Wonderful. What does exposure mean to you when you help people? So exposure is an important word in therapy, and I think it can also be kind of a triggering word. Yeah. Um, I think what it, what it means in very simple terms is if there's something, uh, a, a, an environment or a situation that you have to get through, um, and it's a trigger or it's, a, it's a, an extreme challenge for somebody and you decide that you still want to get through it, you are um, going to experience that, that situation or environment repeatedly in order to learn how to navigate it. And mm -hmm. I'm going to give you a really personal example. Sure. I'm having an exposure right now <laughs> because I, while I enjoy talking with people about what I do, I'm not super comfortable on camera, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I, my value is that I really value this community and I know this show is important and I really want people to understand what I do and what other behaviorists do. So I decided that given those values, I want to come on the show today and I'm sort of uh, in my discomfort zone. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what exposure is. It's getting, I once heard a therapist say, get comfortable being uncomfortable. Exactly. Right? I think one of the tricks is knowing um, how much discomfort is the right level, how much to yeah. tolerate. Some people um, will do a real extreme exposure, like all or none, like jumping in the deep end. Um, <laughs> and I, I think that I um, help my clients by understanding them and learning about them and setting up the exposures so they're exactly right for their comfort um, so that they're tackling just a little bit, you know, just a little bit of what they can handle mm -hmm. bit by bit. I rarely have a client come to me saying, I want to jump in the deep end. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. Might happen. Thank you, Stacy, And of course, thank you again, Michelle. Um, our book correspondent, uh, Jennifer Brooks, has a question for our guest as well. Okay, so Michelle, you've talked a lot about helping people improve their own behavior to become better people. Well, unfortunately, not everyone in this world seems to want to become a better person. We live in a world where it seems like every day someone else chooses to do a behavior that we get upset about. As an example, somebody stole my lunch at the office on Thursday. And then we're constantly hearing about things in the news, like as we're taping this, the, there were four people murdered in Idaho. That's been making headlines for weeks. And so, I mean, what are people supposed to do when we know that we live in this kind of world and we can't control other people's behavior? This is a great question, Jennifer. I'm glad you asked. And I think it's related. Um, there is a lot of difficulty in our world and a lot of challenge in our world and we're also surrounded by a lot of information and access to information and social media that keeps reminding us of those unpleasant things. You know, our brains are kind of wired also to go towards the unpleasant. It's, it comes from our ancient sort of human wiring which kept us safe. But sometimes we actually think things are um, really dangerous when they're not actually dangerous. They're 
just very, very unpleasant. Um, and so how do we deal with this? Um, one of my favorite books, I'm a big fan of books, and I know you brought one too we're going to talk about. I'm excited about that. One of my favorite books in helping people is a book called Stuff That Sucks. And everybody in this world is going to encounter stuff that sucks. There's different degrees of suckiness, um, for sure. And some things that suck are more like a one or a two, and some are really, really horrific tens. Um, and we also need to get through our day, and we, we need to be the people we want to be, right? To live really fulfilling lives, we're going to have to navigate, especially through the one through fives, without being too overwhelmed by them or we're really gonna struggle to be the people we wanna be and have the lives we wanna have. So having said that, there are a lot of strategies we can use to sort of manage our own res emotional response to that, right? We can understand what our response is in the first place. It's good to recognize, whoa, this is really getting me upset, right? It's, this is really frustrating me. This is really frightening me. So just noticing how you're feeling is like the first step to understand and how you're going to navigate the stuff that sucks, right? And from that place, once you understand that, just doing that can, there's science that says that can bring down your emotional uh, dysregulation. It can help you on the path towards feeling a little more regulated and making a good choice how you're going to respond to that situation or even if you're going to respond to that situation, right? Um, so I think what we do is we, we use strategies um, and that's where also clinical psychology is very, very helpful to understand our emotional response to situations and regain some emotional regulation so that we can respond as the people we want to be. Related to Jennifer's question, before our program began, Michelle, uh, you had mentioned that there is a thing that you have dealt with on a fairly frequent occasion uh, that triggers people. So could you tell our viewers about that? Right. So um, we all have things in our lives that cause us discomfort and that may trigger us. And um, sometimes those triggers are associated with one's um, neurological makeup. They might be uh, affect our sensory responses. And a trigger that I've come across in my work is the happy birthday song, which um, some people may just dislike a little. Some people may love it. Uh, some people may like it. Some people may dislike it. And other people, it may be a really big trigger for um, feeling overwhelmed, really uh, sensorily dis disturbed by it. Um, I've seen people run out of the room in response to the song or scream and shout or even trash the cake. Um, and so there's different ways to help a person in that situation. Um, I think it's important to help a person in that situation because uh, while we may understand why that response happened, that response also has an effect on other people, right? And the people at the party or the birthday celebrant um, may be overwhelmed by that response, you know, by having somebody trash their cake or run out of the room. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really in um, somebody's best interest to help that situation if they would agree. And I think there's different responses we can, we can different uh, strategies we can use. You know, somebody might be interested to learn to use headphones because they still want to be a part of the group. Um, but navigating all the crazy sounds, you know, of group singing could be hard. Mm -hmm. um, somebody might just want to miss the song but be part of the party. And so what we've done in our community is we often give a warning before the song. Oh, hey, we're going to be singing the birthday song today. It's Joe's birthday. We'll let you know when it happens. And then people just leave the room and they come back when the song is over. Um, some people may decide that parties, birthday parties and parties in general are not their thing. It's not everybody's thing to go to a party. There's a lot of social mm -hmm. pressure to attend parties, but sometimes parties just either are never your thing or maybe just mm -hmm. today you're just not up for it and that's an option too. Um, sometimes people have interesting thoughts about the song and I had somebody say they didn't like the song because it was just too many words. And uh, we counted them, and we discovered there's 16 words in the birthday song. And they decided that eh, they could live with 16 <laughs> words, and, um, and it helped, and they were better able to navigate the birthday song. One additional question, if we have time, and it's a big one. 
Uh, have you found in your our practice that there is anything that can be done uh, for potential clients who really need to change their behavior but don't think they should or don't think they can? Yeah, that's a big challenge. Um, and I think for adults, it's a really important, um, their autonomy is number one. And I think um, if, if a behavior is causing somebody great difficulty in their lives, um, there's degrees of that, right? A behavior can be dangerous to somebody's life or to somebody else's life. Mm -hmm. And that, that takes on a different level of significance. And even then, I think it's really important to help people um, own their behavior change because mm -hmm. it will be most effective, right? <laughs> so one of the skills I have as a, as a behavior consultant is, is working with people and talking with people and helping them to explore if that behavior is helping them in their life or harming them. And if they can see that it's harming them um, themselves, then oftentimes they may be interested to make a change. What, what is your favorite part about being a behavioral therapist? Wow, I like a lot, a lot of parts of my job. I think um, it brings me back to when I was a teenager. I think I really like the communities that I work in. Um, I think that was my original draw, and it remains a draw. I think the people I know, my clients, the pe their circles of support, they're wonderful. They're creative. They're unique. Um, they're compassionate. They're inclusive. They're the they're the community I want to be in, and so I think that's that's just a favorite thing about my job. I really like uh, different activities that that we do together. Uh, we create opportunities to practice the skills we're working on, and some of those opportunities are just really fun. I meet my clients in in their environments. I meet them at work. I meet them in the park. I meet them at cafes, wherever uh, they choose to work on the challenges we're working on. I love that too. Mm -hmm. And then to end up, um, could you tell us a little bit about some of the work that you do uh, with our community? Uh, we previously had you on where you are discussing Schulpen House. Could you go into that and perhaps some other areas? Sure. So I work um, in the, the Schulpen community, which is part of the Jewish Family and Children's Services. It's their disability community. And we run a social club, which is just whole lot of fun. We do a, a huge variety of things. Hopefully we offer something for everyone at some point in the month or the year. Our activities are always changing. Uh, just last Thursday we went to the Exploratorium after dark and it was a blast. Um, uh, we just, yeah, we, we also offer dinners at our big beautiful home and people in the community come over and it's, it feels like cheers, right? It's like a place <laughs> where it's not a bar, but it is a place where everyone knows your name and um, you can feel welcome. If you want to hang out and do a puzzle, that's fine. If you want to have a meal together, cook together, um, I just, I, th that's a really nice uh, a community and, and our communities emerge in that, in that setting. Well, excellent, excellent. And then very finally, if members of our viewing community are, would be interested in, in communicating with you, what's the best way they should get hold of you? Uh, they can reach me at um, michellehecht123 at gmail.com or through the JFCS um, and the disability specialist there, so that would be michellehecht at jfcs.org. We'll now hear from Jennifer Brooks, our book correspondent. Uh, thank you, Keith. And today I would like to tell you about a book called Destructive Emotions. A Scientific Dialogue with the Dalai Lama, narrated by Daniel Goleman, who pioneered the concept of emotional intelligence and has written many books on the topic, and some of which I hope to feature in future episodes. So, first thing to understand is that this is not a recipe book where it tells you do A, B, and C, and you can overcome your destructive emotions. This book focuses much more on the science of emotion, the neuroscience of emotion, the psychology of emotion, and some of the sociology of emotion, because nobody lives in an emotional bubble. Our emotions and our behaviors can influence other people's emotions and behaviors, and vice versa. We all know that, at least intuitively. So, how can we overcome destructive emotions? Well, here is 
a quote from His Holiness the Dalai Lama himself. What is required is a general preparation so that your basic mental state is like a healthy immune system. Familiarize yourself with these practices, the wisdom side and also skillful means. This familiarization gives you some strength, some experience there. Then when you see anger, attachment, and by attachment he means greed, or jealousy about to come, it's much easier to deal with them. If you have that basic preparation, then in an ideal situation, you may be able to detect signs of emotions coming on, like Michelle was talking about earlier. If your level of realization is high enough, you would have cultivated a temperament that allows you to detect early signs of these emotions and so that you can prevent their arising. So, yes, it seems Michelle and His Holiness the Dalai Lama seem to be in agreement that we can, we can become more mindful and become more aware of our emotional states and our emotional triggers so that we can recognize when a destructive emotion such as anxiety or anger is coming on and you know, gain some control of it in the early stages, because I don't know about the rest of you, but once I'm going on beyond a certain level of emotional arousal, the executive functions of my brain completely shut down. And you know, even though I recognize, even in the moment, that my behavior is unhealthy and it's destructive and it could cause other people to not like me, I just lose the ability to control it. So yes, being mindful and able to gain control over our destructive emotions in their early stages is very important. They discuss this throughout the book. They also discuss meditation as a way of being more mindful. And one of our ASEN friends, Anne Laura Dobbin, has an online meditation session at least once a month. And she has also written her own autobiography about how meditation has helped her overcome her destructive emotions. She too was on the autism spectrum. She too was had her autism completely ignored because no one realized that she had it. That's triggered a lot of destructive emotions for her, as it did for me, as it did, I'm sure, for a lot of other people, people watching this show. And so the book is Destructive Emotions. A Scientific Dialogue with the Dalai Lama, narrated by Daniel Goleman. Thank you. Uh, we'll now uh, hear from Stacy Kennedy, our cultural correspondent. Hello, everybody, and Happy New Year. Um, what I'd like to share, um, Saturday, January 21st, the uh, Emmy Award-winning um, documentary series on Netflix, Love on the Spectrum, is going to come to Ascend, and a representative is going to speak on Zoom about the show and so um yeah they clearly ask and want us to join and talk about the show and come with your questions and experiences that you have at, about of romance and autism and the aim of the series is to send a positive message that uh people on the spectrum can and do find love so again that is um 10 a.m January 21st, Saturday, 10 a.m. on Zoom. And um, if you're on the email list of Ascend, you should be able to get the Zoom link. The same day, uh, starting at 5 and 8 p.m. in Santa Cruz, at the Moose Lodge will be a dance party and it's a f with free food and free dancing. Oh, and you can contact Elizabeth at autismfnsc.org for that. Last thing, January 29th will be a live virtual concert on YouTube. The artist is to be determined. Um, the music will be for autism, orchestrating stronger lives, and they welcome all individuals, and it's on YouTube. So um, friends across the nation, bring your families, or you're there in your room already. So um, you can attend their interactive concert, which starts at 11 a.m. RSVP will be at musicforautism.org. Well, folks, uh, for this week, this is uh, our great show, Ascend TV, Life on the Autism Spectrum, with our great guest, Michelle Hecht. 
Uh, I'm Keith Halperin. I'm Will Burnick. Stacey Kennedy. Jennifer Brooks. And Michelle Hecht. Mm -hmm. Until next time, stay well and stay happy.